looking forward to this one as I know nothing about 122 gigs and up. So introducing Chris Whitmarch, G0FDZ. He was first licensed in 1969 as GHCIU. In <laughs> Interest in microwaves from the mid 70s when he became operational on 23, 13 and 10 gigs. Employed in the telecom industry at BT and in Marsat as an engineer for over 30 years before changing to the educational sector before retirement. Licensed as G0FDZ in 1986. He was now operational on all bands up to 241 gigs and beyond. And is also the beacon keeper for the wonderful GB3 VHF and GB3 UHF. So, without further ado, Chris, 122 gigs and up. Thank you very much indeed. Just, uh, is that all okay? Yep, thank you. Very good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you indeed for coming to this talk. And I suppose most of you have got licenses, and at some time you looked at your license schedule, and you looked at all those bands at the bottom of it, and you think, who on earth operates on these frequencies? Well, that's what this is all about. I'm going to tell you what we do, how we do it, and sort of things that we are looking to do in the future. So, what bands are we talking about? Well, this is what we're going to go through. We're going to have the induction to the bands, number of users on the bands, some of the positives and negatives, propagation path losses, and terms of waveguide and signal sources, principles, mixers, we use a lot of those, typical equipment, the equipment we use for greater than 275 gigs and signs from operating SDR use. So, the bands are 122 gigs, that's 2.5 millimetre wavelength. Yes. Next band up is 134 gigs, that's 2 millimetre wavelength. Then we come to top band. <laughs> 241 gigs, that's our top band on your licence, wavelength of 1.2 millimetres. And also now, if you've got an NOV, you can operate on a whole range of frequencies above 275 gigs. That's a wavelength of less than one millimetre. Well, there are three stations we know on 122 at the moment. That's going to change very soon. There's about seven stations I know on 134, three stations on 241, and Roger GHCUB and myself on 288 gigs. Why do we do it? Why do I torture myself with these, with these frequencies? Well, it's new microwave territory. It's very, very interesting. It's something doing something quite, quite different. And we're looking at mainly largely unexplored frequencies above 100 gigs. We use very much commercially, so above 100 gigs, we're mainly giving it to us amateurs to play with them. Hopefully we do a good job. We do use some techniques, some of which are unfamiliar at lower microwave frequencies. And many technical challenges. Half the challenge is getting the gear going as well as operating the, the gear. I'm afraid you can't go to Mr Lynch downstairs or buy your 241 gig fully synthesised transceiver. It's just not possible. You have to build it. And I've got a lot of fun out of both operating equipment and getting it going. Sometimes you think you'll never get it going, but eventually you do. Negatives, well, <coughs> there is hardly anything published. You really have to scrape around for information on ideas and use some of, some of the things that you can generate yourself. A lot of information on the web from Germany, but you need to know how to find it. You'll find that water vapour and oxygen in the atmosphere can be very high loss at many of the frequencies. I'll show you that on the graph very soon. Components can be difficult to quiet time to can be expensive, a slight understatement at times. <laughs> Obviously it would be great to have more stations operational, but this we have been is quite small. And another understatement, some experience on lower microwave frequencies is highly desirable. But we get greater pers personal satisfaction from getting it going and having to go at something new. And on many of these bands, we know very little about propagation, very little indeed. On 24, we can 
find out because there's lots of people fix station operating, but on the high millimetric bands where it's strictly portable, you're not going to be there for hours on end. So we don't know very much about propagation. If the weather's poor, you wouldn't be out anyway. And the millimetric bands, they are going to be a new era. Give you an example. I went to an IET seminar a few months back. There's the airport scanning radar, our project's 300 gigs, but will basically scan you for anything undesirable before you've even realised it in a small room. It operates at 300 gigs, it's in academia at the moment, but it's going to be a reality very soon. And also, on board, PCBs, at the moment you might have an octocoupler coupling two different circuits together. You may soon have a 300 gig transceiver communicate either within the board or two adjacent boards. It's all going to be reality very soon. Propagation, well, propagation is very much line in sight. We don't know too much about it, but that's how it tends to be at the moment. So there's much to be learnt. Now, this atmospheric water and oxygen can have severe detrimental effects on propagation at highest millimetre wave frequencies, and here's a graph. Here are the three bands that we're talking about, 122, 134 and 241. You see on 122, you are very close to a peak of 118.5 where you have oxygen absorption. But the water vapour can vary. So there's times on the day, on the weather, when it's good to operate and other times when it's not good to operate. So that's what we're going to explore a little more carefully in a minute. So I don't know of anywhere where the oxygen varies. Even up a mountain, it's not going to vary enough to make any real difference. But the water vapour does vary. And the amount of water is the amount of water contained in a cubic metre of, of air. And that's the relative humidity. Relative means it's relative to the temperature. The warmer the temperature, the more water the cubic metre of air can contain. So... Obviously, the best time is off, 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 obviously to operate when the temperature is low. That's normally determined by the dew point. So really, the best time to operate is freezing cold in the winter. I will just deviate slightly. The guy who's got the 241 gig record in the States told me that he nearly lost his toes due to frostbite. You remember that, Brian? I think there are no limits, and that's one of them. If you want to calculate the losses, well, you'll need to know the um, relative humidity. You used to be able to use a whirling psychrometer years ago, like a football rattle, but now there's plenty of electronic instruments available. One time that said Mapfin, but that's a, a name that's gone now, says eBay. OK. Also, when you've got some information, you can calculate losses using some software, BKCUM's Atmosphere, and... Gisele MJW's gas loss give you an easy way of calculating. So the total path loss, so any path is a free space loss, which is, can be calculated plus any oxygen losses, plus any water vapour losses, plus any extra water vapour due to rain or fog along the path when you shouldn't be out anyway. Here's an example at 122 gigs. You can see here we can calculate from the temperature the water density, we've got an extra 1.034 dB per kilometre on top of free space loss. That soon adds up. So it really does make a difference to operate when the, the uh, relative humidity is low. Warm air always holds more water vapour than cool air. Again, how do we see if past possible? Well, again, Mike Willis, GCRMJW's path checking program is good. This path here is a path on 241 from Higham to Thameside, which I did uh, with Roger GHCUB over 9.3 kilometres. That's the, the Earth, believe it or not, it is round. I should remember a flat Earth society. <laughs> and here, that actually is the River Thames. So you can see a fair amount of this path was over River Thames. That's one reason why we think we had extra losses on that, that particular path, because the amount of length of the path was taking over water. OK, K-factor. 
Some of you will be familiar with the k-factor uh, microwaves. 1.3 is what we generally use, bands like 10 gigs. It means the signal goes optically plus a little bit more. We think on the higher frequencies, we really ought to be using k-factor 1, which is optical, at least for the moment. So we really look at true line sight paths. Believe it or not, there are some quite long paths line sight, at least over 100 kilometres. We also use waveguide. I know some people have an aversion to it, but it's very good for the antennas because it's a loss at these frequencies. We normally use copper or silver because it's low conductivity. I know, don't know of an amateur that uses silver, but I know silver's been used commercially. You can have it in rectangle, which is what we have here. Circular, we you know, as a hole, so some metal wax as a waveguide, or elliptical, and you join the waveguide together with flanges. Typical waveguide for one to two gigs will cost about 50 pounds a foot. So you use it carefully. Antennas, well, again, just like lower microwave frequencies, we use horns, they can be pyramidal, they can be um, conical. We also use dishes with a splash feed. Even an icing cone nozzle has been pressed into use as a horn for 241. Works very well. Icing cone nozzle. Beacons, well, I'm afraid there aren't any permanent beacons, as you used to say. There was a proposal for a beacon at 134, but I've had to take that out because that's not going to happen now. So there are no permanent beacons on these bands in the UK. But if you need to have a signal source, they're highly desirable, you could make a signal source that you could key from maybe a, a 13 gig phase op source fed into a, a diode as a multiplier. Or you can find something that can offer you a signal. That's the other option. Right, the highest bands, that's the bands we're talking about. We tend to use either what's called fundamental mixers or harmonic mixers or multipliers from lower frequencies. We normally try and start these days around 11 or 12 gigs so that we're not multiplying too many times up. Now, this is another obvious statement, but believe it or not, it's true. The more power you can generate, the more chance you've got of working further. And believe it or not, love it or loathe it, CW is better than SSB for this. Now, I'm not a lover of CW, but I use it. I appreciate the power of the mode. And believe you me, on these bands, you're not going to get anybody to come back to you at 20 words a minute. If you want it 8 words a minute or 10 words a minute, somebody will send it to you at that speed. So you never have to worry about somebody coming back at 20 words or, or faster. You can use the mix on transmit as well as receive. Problem is the conversion is very poor and you won't get much power out. So often we tend to use harmonic or fundamental mixers for receive and have a separate multiplier transmitter. Again, if you go downstairs on the UK microgroup stand, you'll see a separate transmitter next to the, um, the, uh, fundamental, uh, sorry, the harmonic mixers. So, we tend to use db 6 nt transvertibles. I use a harmonic mixer. We use a special mixer diode, which I'll come, across, come up against very soon. Use a source that's lower than the frequency required for the LO. For example, 22.416 uses a 6 harmonic to derive the local oscillator frequency of 134.496. That will explain it a little bit better. We feed the local oscillator at this frequency into the diode, it generates harmonics. The sixth harmonic is mixed with the IF of 432, for example, to give you 134.928. And then the output waveguide acts as a high-pass filter to filter out all those nasty low-frequency components. So it really is doing you a big favour. And you can use FT290 if you've still got one, the IF strip at 2 metres, or Nowadays, most people use 817s, either 2 metres or 77s for the IF. I tend to use IF432 because you've got more tuning range. On well, some local oscillator frequencies, you can't be too selective as to what the, the frequency is, so you may have to tune it backwards. 
I'll use tune, for example, 436 to 434 backwards. Not a problem, provided you remember to use the lower sideband to receive any upper sideband signals. You could, if you wanted to, use 23 or 10 gigs for the IF. It's first IF. You can tie up to Rog I know on one of the bands, GHCUB, used 10 gigs as the first IF because it was, a, it was something he had available. That's a diode. <laughs> now, I always tell this story because I, I know you'll laugh. They used to cost about £50 each. I actually lost two in the carpet. Now, you, you, you put on a binocular magnifier and you get down the carpet. You know you're not going to find it, but you feel better if having looked. <laughs> That's all I can say. They are fixed to the board with an epoxy glue under a microscope. Right, the 122 gig band, that's the first band, 2.5 millimetres. As you saw from the chart earlier, it's quite severely uh, problematic with oxygen absorption, but for many years we didn't seem to use it in this country, but in actual fact I think it's got quite some good potential if you choose the right day to operate. Um, European, particularly German, Austrian, interested me in very good, many records set. And I'm afraid there isn't much equipment above 100 gigs, so there's very little surplus equipment. So most of the time you have to build it yourself. I use, downstairs you can see, there's a receive and transmit mixer designed for the transverter. You can buy stuff from Germany, DL2AM and DB6NT both sell boards and other components that are useful. But there's some new technology on the horizon. A TRA120 series chip's become available, and this is a complete chip. It's produced because 122 is an ISM frequency. That's why it gave it to us, because it's used to so people use it as an ISM frequency, also give it to us radio amateurs. But this 122 radar chip is made by Silicon Radar. It's got everything on one small board, on one small chip. It's got all the millimetric circuitry actually on the chip. It's very firm and synthesized on the board, and the chip also contains an antenna, including a lens. So very good. And the output power is actually 0.5 by milliwatt. That's really QRO compared to what we've had. So it's going to make a big difference. $200 is for the board with the chip. So it's very affordable. There are some small technical issues being resolved. That's OK. And to make it compatible with UK, we're going to have to have it operate at 122.4. But the units will be supplied pre programmed for that. So things are really hot up on this horizon. It actually is an FF and CW transceiver. It originates from Australia, and that's where the boards are coming from as well. When I say CW, it actually uses FSK, but the FSK is so wide-spaced that it's spaced by the IF, so you, you'll never hear the mark, the space frequency, you only hear the mark. For you, you just need to provide a solid, solid dish or horn for the antenna and a two-meter receiver only for the IF because it contains its own built-in CW and FM transmitter. So it would be very easy to get going on this millimetre band and encourage activity, which is what we badly need. That's the board. This is the chip, just here. This is the board, and this is one of the systems that the guys in Australia have made. So all things are hot up on this front in this country very soon. We expect the boards to arrive here about Christmas time. If you want more conventional mixer, this is a mixer I use for a 122 gig SSB and CW. The board's obtainable from DB6NT and you fix it to an aluminium base and behind this board is drilled a hole, the right size. It's 1.7 millimetres, so that's a round waveguide hole to the outside world. So just behind the board there is a 1.7 millimetre hole. 1.7, it's quite a small hole to drill. 
So you take it with real care. Otherwise, you hear this terrible twang, and then your block's ruined, you start again. That's my system. You can see it downstairs. I use this slab mixer. So I had some involvement in designing it. It's just a block of slab of aluminium with a hole for the wave guide drilled in, and then it's just this backstop here for tuning. Very simple mixer. Makes construction millimetre wave mixers for any millimetre wave band easy. So, the slab mixer's good for that. All you need to do is drill a right side wave guide hole for 1 to 2, you want 1.7 millimetres, and the holes for the mounting board. The wave guide hole acts as a high pass filter to remove all those are nasty, unwanted products of the lower frequencies. Because Waveguide has a, a low, low frequency cutoff. It passes signals above but cuts everything off below its cutoff. Also, as I say, all millimetre wave mi mixers, there's no way of preventing the local oscillator signal being radiated. So, to be a good boy, you really should make sure it's in the right part of the band, our band. Don't radiate it where it might not be required or appreciated. And I'm afraid image filters as well. This is just a pipe dream at the moment for these frequencies. So we have no image rejection of the noise on the image frequency. So receiver performance is going to suffer. But that's just what you have to put up with. This is Roger GHCUB and myself when we're getting our systems going, you can see here. And then we went on to make um, our first QSO on the band in the UK. Now, stability in GTO is bad, so we, we've replaced any crystal-based LO with a phase-lock loop LO because it, it's made a big difference. It's really been the key to the development of the millimetre wave bands by having a phase-lock loop source, which used to be available for £45 from Israel. Probably sold out them now. But there's another source available for a reasonable price from New Zealand. Now, if you've got one milliwatt, you are definitely QRO on this band. Fantastic. I don't know anyone who's got milliwatt. Most of the time on these mixers, we're talking about maybe 100 or 200 milliwatts. I'm sorry, microwatts. Now, we used to have a band at 142. Procom used to make a dish. That dish could also be used for this band. But you need to understand the dish. Although it's only a small dish, it's still got a beam of only 0.8 of a degree. So, point it isn't exactly easy. Procom aren't making the dish, but you can replicate the splash plate feed for another dish. I've done that downstairs, you can see that. And also, we found that horns in dishes that are made for other frequencies, like 50 gigs or 80 gigs, often work perfectly well, particularly horns at these frequencies, very well. But we, there's no hard and fast rule, you just have to try it and see. That's the board, the DB6NT mixer board for this frequency. You can see here, there's the 1.6 millimetre hole for the waveguide. The guide goes across that little gap there, glued with epoxy silver loaded adhesive under a microscope. Not the sort of thing you do if you just have an argument with the wife or you've been out on the booze the night before. What the, the diode? Oh, that, that's what I showed earlier. The oh, it's a fraction of a millimetre. You have to pick up on the end of a wetted alcohol cocktail stick, transfer it to the board under a microscope. Not the sort of thing you want to do. I'll see if we can quickly go back to that. Come on. Ah, there we are. There it is. That's a diode. So I'll just go back. Sorry about that. <coughs> right, 134 gigs, 2 millimetres. Again, this is the system I use. You can see it downstairs. This is the phase loop source, the Elcom source, 45 pounds from Israel. 
and various multipliers to drive a mixer with its base frequency before the mixer actually produces a harmonics. Now, one thing we often do, now this isn't a cure, so this is just testing. We just test the gear, it's actually working before we actually go out and try it over distance. So Roger tested the system before we did some tests across the Thames. And I went to All Hallows, wanted to do a short story, he had to go to, to um, Canvey Island. You can imagine some of the comments from some of the people there, can't you? <laughs> That's over five kilometre path. Good test. Anybody from Campy Island? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> two four one top band, one point two millimeters. Well, again, a DP six harmonic mixed dynes available, but it's very inefficient. It uses a tenth harmonic, so it's not going to be very good. So what we did, we got over that by using a thirty four gig LO rather than twenty four gig, and we used a seventh harmonic, so we got slightly more out of it. Even so, output is very low indeed. And if you don't use a PRL, you might as well not bother with the band because the jitter is so severe with a crystal source, it's just not even worth contemplating. Believe it or not, CW is a bit easy. It's mode to use at this frequency. It's not hard. All you've got to do is exchange reports and locator and the guy's call sign, that's it. Exactly. <laughs> so it's even easier, isn't it? Now, atmospheric water vapour can be severe, so you need to make sure that you operate in the right weather. When we made the first QSO on, two point, on 241 over 7.3k, we went out five times before we finally made the contact because of either technical problems or, or propagation. Normally, you'd have an extra, about 4.5 dB per kilometre extra on the path loss, but if you've got light mist, be 9 dB, that's quite severe. This is per kilometre. Can you imagine that over 7 kilometres? There we are, output very low for mixers, about 10 microwatts at the best. You might think, oh, I'm not going to work anything with 10 microwatts, but you will be surprised. Waveguide 30 is the right size. I haven't actually found anybody that actually sells Waveguide 30 in the UK. So we tend to use a round hole in the aluminium block. But even so, the hole is around about 0.8 to 1 millimetre in diameter. 0.8 should carry it if the hole is smooth, but it's not easy to draw a smooth bore hole in a 0.8 of a millimetre. So we've tended to draw it to 1 millimetre and everything's OK. Not very easy drawing 0.8 of a millimetre as well. Again, we use very small horns or dishes, very sharp beam widths and very high gains. But we have no antennas actually designed for 241. We're using low, fre low frequency horns and dishes, which work okay at 241. Germany saw the first activity in the USA. Germany uses 920, but Roger and myself had the first QS on the band, February 2016, and we used 241.010. That's just because it was a convenient frequency with the LOs that we had. That's the mixer ball. It looks very similar to the one for five. There is a slight difference between the two, but the die goes across a little gap here. And behind the gap is the wide guide aperture of one, one millimetre or 0.8 of a millimetre. All right, it's testing the gear. I was extremely pleased to see some mixer current, the two for one. Couldn't believe my luck. And this is how you start off testing, over a few inches. I remember one of my friends said, how far you work today, Chris? So it's across the table. <laughs> but eventually you can increase the range. And look, this, uh, this is a spectrum analyzer showing a signal at 241. Don't see that on the spectrum analyzer very often. Just one button, there we are. A 241 gig signal on the spectrum analyzer. Here's a... Roger's got some mixers. <laughs> Indeed. Here's my setup. This is at Hyam here. This box, I'll tell you about this box later. It's actually a light source. And this is Roger's end. 
This is at Thurrock. This is at the... That's the first path we worked at 7.3 kilometres from Higham in Kent to West Tilbury and then Higham in Kent to Thurrock Thameside. Notice a large, on the second path there's a large amount on the water. That's why the signal we think was much worse in strength than it was between the, the quick hop across the Thames. So the first, first path we worked on SSB, second path was CW. Right, well, there are bands above 241. Just got time to tell about this before we finish. Germany used 411 gigs. And amateurs, as I say, have used 322 and 503. Probably people have borrowed gear from work for the weekend, I, I suspect. That's my guess. But DV6NT, he built the equipment himself. He had a QSO over 50 metres in 1998 with SSB. Or 411, I think that's fantastic. I think his equipment at the time used some same quasi optical techniques. It's actually published in Jubus. Americans have made contacts on those bands over about 1.4k, that's very good. And they are at the very top of the radio spectrum. It actually officially ends at 300 gigs. So these bands are actually submillimeter, submillimetric bands or terahertz bands. So there's completely different techniques for generator or RF often require at these frequencies. So that's often the case, but not always. Well, most of the cases we're just extending what we're doing at 241 to a bit higher. Now, if you've got a full license, you can get an NOV from Ofcom. It allows you to access the whole range of bands up to 1,000 gigs, also from 1,000 to 3,000 gigs. So it's a frequency subject to no interference to existing power private passive services. We're really only sharing with radio astronomy to big ones, but there are restrictions within 20 kilometres of certain radio astronomy sites. Doesn't affect us around here. As I say, some of these frequencies equipment may in the future be using quasi-optical techniques. And Roger produced early working stage equipment for 288. That's my NOV from Ofcom. You have to state all the sites that you're going to use here. This is what I've done here. Just here. And all sorts of what you can do, what you can't do. But believe it or not, you're allowed 100 milliwatts. I said to Murray, how did you get 100 milliwatts? He said, oh, I just asked them for it. I said, OK. <laughs> I mean, 100 milliwatts, that would be fantastic. So that's Roger's early equipment. At the time, he was using a lens hall. That's a, literally a, 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 a sort of, um, oh dear, all right. Lens horn is a horn launcher into an aperture, it has a lens on the end, actually just like light. Works well, fine at microwave frequencies. That's our equipment over our first contact. Again, this is Roger's fantastic receiver, it uses a 47 gig of our first IF, yeah, 47 gig DB6NT transverter. If you think about it, 47 gigs plus 241 is 288. That's a transmitter using a horn. I think that's an 80 gig horn that works well at these frequencies. I received Roger also over 1.246 kilometre path at 589. Very nice signal. But the actual two way contact was just over 175 metres because we had one fantastic receiver and one not quite so fantastic receiver. And then. Finally, we got something out of the receiver to make it work, and we have QA QSO on 288 over a 1.2 plus 6 kilometer path. That's through my telephoto lens, that's where Roger's located, nice clear path to him. That's my, my setup at the bottom of the hill. So, how do we operate on these bands? Well, I think reliable equipment power supply is essential. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean the battery isn't going to go flat, well, and you've got to worry about how much power you've got left while you're trying to work out a hard contact. 
I mean, the library equipment, you don't want wires to fall off. It's only simple when you're taking all this equipment out. So put some care into making sure it's physically reliable. Radio talkback. Just like we used to do in 10 gig days when you get a signal, you often want to feed it back over the talkback to the station at the other end to pick up. So, case tears are going to help you on the phrase, you need to use two metres. And believe it or not, Roger, Roger and myself, thank you, Roger and myself use two metre FM for mostly short range contacts. Can use two, two metre SSB, of course, no problem at all. Or oh, incidentally, my, my FM set did, did go wrong last time, Chris. Thank you very much for repairing it. But I had to end up using my mobile phone to feed the signal back. So I always have a backup. Piece like map work with a path draw on ordnance survey maps. Look through the sighting tube for near landmarks that you can see along the path. While the path from Higham to Basildon passes very close to the steep horns. Heim Church, which is about two or three kilometres away. A very nice way of lining up the antennas. There is a, a website, I'm sure you've seen this, it's based on Google, Google Earth. You can use 10 digit locators, which is what we prefer to use on these frequencies, 10 digit locators. On most microwaves now, you've anyway, gone over to 8 digit locators. And if you Plot the map, as you saw on the earlier slides, you can enter it into a JPEG and print it out if you, you, you need it. The rifle site needs careful alignment with an antenna system. So how you would do it, and several people have asked me this, is that what you would do, you would get a signal, maybe a couple of kilometres away where you can see the other station, pick it radio-wise, and then adjust the site to correspond with the crosshairs station that you can actually see. Sites, I think, are something like a 4 by 40 is the size site I tend to use. The other way is to use a 5 watt red LED. Now, I got this idea from Barry, you know, AGM. 5 watt red LED behind a Fresnel lens, and you can see this over many kilometres. Looks like that. Box I built inside. And the LEDs at the back here, and on this side is a Fresnel lens, actually an A4 magnifier from Ryman, buy for about three quid. Works a treat. I also notice I also have to have a, a rifle sight actually on the, on the alignment aid, but it's very good to spot the spot the station at the other end. And you don't need to leave it on all the time. All you need to do is find out where the guy is. One problem we found is that often you think it's higher in elevation than he actually is. And this is a good way of telling. Obviously, temperature humidity is a term of the best time to operate. I said we went out five times. We thought, thought the weather was good enough. It wasn't, wasn't quite good enough, so that's why it failed. So we need to do more work on that. And if you want... If you've got one of these SDR dongles, you know the type you can plug in. You can take the 68.33 meg from the back of an FT817, feed it into the PC running SDR, HDR, and you can spot weak signals that are outside the actual current tuning band but within the Y band. So it's easy to spot a signal with the SDR. That's one, one thing that we also do. And that, guys, is the end of it. Now I'll give you a very quick run down on what sort of mad things that we do. Um, if you're interested in converters, that's great. But if you are, if you're not converted, if I've actually just told you the things that we do and that we are making use of these bands, then we've achieved some objective. If you do want to find out more information, the UK Microwave Group is the place to go. Roger's also got some interesting interesting information on his website and you can also email me. And that's it. Sorry, nice so, well sorry, sorry, I spoke a bit fast. No, it's fine. That's fine, fine, fine. Patrick Moorish. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, we've had some fantastic lectures in here over the yesterday and today. It's been absolutely fantastic. So we'll just do some questioning and uh, JR's in the box seat. Hold on. John Renogi, 4SWX. Congratulations, Chris. You have shown 
very clearly that you can command a huge audience from what is one of the most esoteric parts of ham radio. Right, that's the th congratulations. The technical question. If I uh, can't answer it, then I can find out something who can. At, at what sort of frequency, as you go up in the microwave spectrum, do you get more power out by mixing two, cohere two phase lock lasers ah, yes. on a diode over what you would get by multiplication? I don't know the answer to the actual question, but I know that Roger has looked at the idea of mixing lasers together. Okay, because one of my last commercial jobs... You spoke in, with Orwin about it. Ah, one of my last commercial jobs when I was in the fibre optic and laser fabrication area was mixing lasers to produce 50 gigahertz. Yep. It should be... It, I know it's technically quite hard, but effectively what you do is you focus both lasers on, a mi on what is a traditional mixer diode that you've already achieved. So... I, I just wonder what the transition frequency for getting more power out I is. Don't, I don't know the answer, but I think this is an area that has got plenty of opportunity for exploration in the future. Really just start out on this path. Isn't that what this hobby is all about? I think so. Um, great. Any more? Oh, here we go. Hold me a sec. Take this one first. Yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you for it. Thank you very much. Uh, Barry Lewis, G4SJH. I'm actually the microwave manager for the RSGB as well. So I think a very, very interesting uh, presentation, Chris. And uh, I think you've done really well to, to represent the, you know, the most interesting aspects of, of what we're doing in the, in, in the microwave bands and, and higher up. But I have a question as well. Yeah. So um, really about the antennas. And I wonder what, uh, how important, as you go up into the millimeter wave bands in the hundreds of gigahertz, how important does the profile and surface of the antenna become? And the reason I was, I was quite surprised to see in the picture of the Australian uh, system there, they, they've just used a, a TVRO kind of offset dish. Interesting. And I'm that, surprised Barry. that the, the profile of, of a sort I, of I commercial standard dish is, is good enough. Or that's maybe why I'm going to use a horn. I'm going to use a horn for that reason. I don't think the TVRO dish is very suitable, personally. I it's obviously working for them, I guess. Well, it might be up to a point, but you don't know how well it's working. No, exactly, exactly. So you have no feel for, for the, sort of, uh, the sort of surface of the antenna? Uh, to be quite honest, we, we always think horns work better at these frequencies for many reasons. Always, always very predictable as well. Dishes are always a bit um, a funny to set up, difficult to set up. Oh, Andy, oh dear, he's going to ask me something horrible. No, I've just got a quick, <laughs> JNT, I've just got a query about the horns. The horns you showed in the diagram seem to be very short, considering they're going to be very high gain horns. If you'd use the, uh, the AGN horn design software, once you get beyond about 30 dB, which those clearly yes. are, they would get very, very long indeed. Indeed, yes. the length so that's, that's why there's a limit to generally how long horns are. Oh, they're optimised for certain frequencies for those Well, ones, I mean, a, a 24 gig horn, I've got a 22 dB horn that's that long, but a 30 dB would be extremely long indeed. I think there's a practical limit to how long you can, you can get away with it. I looked at them for 24, and... But the 241 conical horn from the icing cone works a treat, you see. I mean, most of the things with these antennas, we don't know. So I think to try something and see if it works, that's all we can do. But we've found horns generally work much better than dishes. Yes, Alistair Watt, G3ZBU. Um, engineering question. How deep is your 0.3 millimetre hole? How deep do you have to drill the aluminium? Is it well, like an inch? Well, that's a quarter or? inch block. A quarter inch. So yeah. it takes a bit of time. You don't go rushing it or pushing too yeah. hard on the drill. Yes, because I've, I've seen people try and use plasma um, cutting where you get a stainless steel pin. And oh, indeed. If, I mean, get a if you could get a smooth bottom. hole by I not think doing something other than drilling, I yeah. think that's a very good idea. Yes, I think the Mullard Space Centre Laboratory do that. I'm afraid my, my workshop yeah. doesn't quite extend to that. Never mind. <laughs> Thank you. My workshop is a stall in the shack. <laughs> okay, we're bang on time. Once again, thanks very much indeed, Chris. Thank Excellent. You.